welcome to Barn Blog. And today I am with Ralph Ruckus, author of two books on China, The Communist Road to Capitalism and The Left in China, a Political Cartography. Um, Ralph Ruckus has been studying the social, economic, political situation, upheaval, however you want to phrase it, of the People's Republic of China for uh, about two decades. Uh, you co-founded the uh, uh, Gong Chao Collective, and um, you've been really focusing in on workers' action, civil unrest, migrant movements, etc., in the country for a while. Um, when people often ask me to get a kind of alternate view on China, I usually point them to Swang and and uh, uh, Gong Chao. So I, I wanted to talk to you, though, about the Chinese left. There's been a lot of recuperation of the PRC in the U.S. in the last four or five years. It's actually kind of slowed down in the last year, I think, for somewhat obvious reasons as the G economic miracle seems to have significantly slowed. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you um, how we define the left in China. Your book kind of looks over the last century. And for a lot of people, China and the left is synonymous. And I think that's almost too tautological leap. In a tautological way, just if we're talking about China, we're talking about the world's left wing government period in the discussion. Um, clearly, you think that's misleading. I think that's misleading. Um, but the way left and right get used in Chinese context, both within dissident circles and also by the government, makes it kind of hard to know what we're talking about. So how do we define the left in China over the last century? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in the book, uh, The Left in China, I use a very broad historical definition. And maybe later in the in the discussion, we can get back to that. Why do we even need a term like left or right? Um, but let me stay with this. I, I, I use a, In the book, I use a very broad and historical definition. So I basically refer to all concepts and practices that have criticized capitalist exploitation and inequality as well as forms of discrimination, oppression um, from positions that are described or that are self-conceived or self-defined as left-wing. And that, you know, may be different to other people. I include, you know, at the beginning, at least, I include people and, and, and movements and actors, uh, regardless whether, in my view, they actually attack all forms of exploitation and discrimination or not. So, you know, that's my starting point. I don't want to exclude, like, Lots of people from the discussion at the at the beginning, and then uh, and then I only talk about like whatever the the pure radical left or something. Um, but when we speak about the left in China as it developed in the twenties, because you go back a little earlier, uh, the book covers you know the development after forty nine. So let's say in the in the twenties, of course, when the Communist Party uh, was fine, founded. I'd say that the CCP, the Communist Party of China, uh, was involved in grassroots organizing and social struggles at that beginning and controlled somehow the revolutionary attempt to overthrow the feudal capitalist regime. But that's before 49. But that, in my view, changed after 49 when the CCP became an authoritarian socialist regime. So I still call it left wing. You know, using that broad concept I described earlier. Um, but then after the reforms, uh, the capitalist reforms uh, starting in 78 and the transition that took China um, into capitalism uh, in the late 90s, in my view, the, the CCP regime again changed its nature and, in my view, actually stopped being a left wing force altogether and became a capitalist force. But, you know, the book starts, you know, the narrative of book starts in 49, and I, I focus mostly on the oppositional left, um, and that is movements and groups that opposed the uh, Communist Party regime and had left-wing practices and demands. You know, there are obviously also other forces. 
but I focus on the on the opposition left wing forces, and especially I focus on a dialectic. Um, I look at social struggles from below. You know, there's strikes or other popular movements that had left wing demands, and then I look at left wing groups and movements. That were inspired by by these social struggles, and so that that's the dialectic I, I look at in in this in this newer book. In the earlier book that we already discussed a while ago, I look at the dialectic between struggles and containment measures or countermeasures by the regime. Right. So this is two different two different perspectives mm -hmm. here. And then when we look at the oppositional forces now, you know, and how they changed. So, you know, from the 50s until today, I think in each phase uh, that I describe in the, in the book, they went through, you know, th there were different actors, um, there were different demands. And obviously, the, you know, the, the situation changed because China went through socialism, through a transition to capitalism. And if you want, we can go deeper into this um, in, the, in the discussion. Yeah, I think we we probably will need to go deeper into this, but I I do think um, uh, the left in China seems hard to get a grip on because there's both oppositional tendencies within the CCP and out or within the PRC uh, within the CCP uh, or the C, uh, and outside of it, um, and that makes it a little more difficult to catalog. Um, where do you see as, uh, well, um, like, for example, in, in 49, what do you see as the first primary oppositional group to the, to the, to the CPC? Well, the, the, you know, there were strikes basically from the very beginning, right? That was the first mm -hmm. strike wave. Um, already, you know, in '49, and then and then a larger one in the mid '50s. Um, you know, we have to see that you know that you know socialism wasn't like constructed within within a few weeks. So it took them like a few years to set up like plant economy, or the institutions needed for that, and then nationalized inter industries. So all this was only accomplished in around '55, and then there were was a, a massive strike wave. And I think in this in this. Um, this strike actually shows the contradictions that you know of, of uh, so, uh, Chinese socialism at the time, because workers had obviously hoped for not just workers, also women, other groups. But now, but now let's let's focus on the workers. The workers had had uh, hoped that um, the takeover of power by the Communist Party would mean that they are in charge, right? That they themselves. Mm -hmm other so-called masters of the factories as, the, as the, they were promised. But then they realized they were not. And I think and especially there was um, there were new inequalities, right? So the first wave and actually the second wave during the Cultural Revolution 10 years later too was supported mostly by um, unprivileged um, discriminated workers, like workers who didn't get like, you know, higher wages, better, better conditions, but felt that actually not much had changed. And there was obviously a part um, of the working class that got good conditions, you know, the so-called iron rice bowl, as, as it was later called. Mm -hmm. um, but that that wasn't all workers. Like it was only a part and a smaller part of the urban workers. And a large part, you know, didn't get these like the like full the full set of welfare measures, better wages, but low wages, unstable working conditions. They were still migrants, like people who came from the countryside. To the cities, but only temporarily, and then were kicked out. Young workers had problems because you know they, they had very low wages. The housing situation was really bad. So, so there were work, workers sensed not only that things were not getting better, but they also sensed there was a new inequality and discrimination and some privileged workers. So they got angry and they you know they basically demand that the promise gets fulfilled and that that basically is the you know the motivation or was the motivation both between the strike wave in, in 50, uh, 1955 and also of a large part of the rebel movement the rebel workers movement in uh, 66 67 mm -hmm. so how did <laughs> how did the regime react to this first wave of strikes <laughs> 
and you know when we see like later things like the the uh the hundred flowers period or whatever how how did this kind of um get either you know repressed or or recuperated um all of the above like how did the regime actually handle this these strikes in the in the mid 1950s well on one hand you know the you know of, of course there's very legitimate demands you know like mm -hmm. um for, from the worker side and the way it, it put like the the regime's legitimacy and you know it challenged the, the regime's legitimacy um so there was no way to just like fully repress it and then that's it you know so at the beginning they also they were nervous uh, at the time uh especially in 56 that the strike wave took like you know went on for over the course of 50 uh 55 56 so in 56 there were also the workers uprising in poland and in hungary so the regime was and workers in china also referred to that so the regime got nervous about this and they, so they made some concessions but in, in in general um you know they they answered with with um with repression like the union especially uh was changed like the union that you know had some you know was based on grassroots organizing uh was later um you know put on on tighter leash um and and basically became like sort of just a mass organization of the party um you mentioned the hundred flowers movement one one um thing that the regime did was allowing criticism for a while uh this was not you know the that the center was not the the workplaces uh it was mm -hmm. you know it was more like sort of what they like professionals you know like like intellectuals other people who had crit uh, criticized the regime so allow uh, the regime allowed criticism um basically to let off steam like you know to also to understand you know what's going on why are people so discontented and um partly that also happened in the factories but they weren't the center and then they uh, the, the regime understood or learned that um there was a lot of criticism and this was partly left wing it was also right, right wing of course um and, uh, but then they started a, a campaign the anti rightist campaign and basically cracked down on everyone who was involved in in this um in this hundred hour movement expressing critique and also they cracked down on worker activists and left-wing activists who had uh, participated by you know in in the strike organizing um and you know they were like rusticated center of the countryside or or punished in other ways so there was a reaction but I, you know, maybe you're into that. I, th I think it's important, you know, the, the regime also like in later, later periods, you know, it learned that re only repression is not the, the way to actually deal with these oppositional movements or social movements from below. Um, repression was definitely a central, a central part, but they, were all, they also used other forms um, like, like concessions or, or cooptation of certain demands. Yeah. Um, you know, this builds up to a, a period that I find actually fairly confusing politically in China. Um, for me, the the paradox of the late of like say 1965 through uh, definitely 1968 um, through 1970. Eight is is hard to kind of wrap my hand around because on one hand, you you have seemingly left figures emerging within the CPC. Uh, you have fairly radical experiments, particularly in the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. Um, you have attempts to actually even get rid of like currency. I mean, it, you know, stuff that the USSR never really even tried. Um, but at the same time. You have a international policy largely responding to the Sino-Soviet uh, split and the revisionist and the second round of revisionist controversies, so-called, and I definitely call them so-called because they have nothing to do with the first revisionist controversies at all. Um, but you have this, uh, you have the the regime under Mao. I mean, so we can't blame this on Dungism starting to to side with capitalist factors or, or uh, 
some would even say quasi-fascist or definitely nationalist authoritarian factors against other communist ones. I mean, justified by sometimes by the three world theory and sometimes just by, by uh, China's foreign policy goals. And it's hard to reconcile an, ex, you know, increasing attempts to maybe co-opt, recuperate, or even sincerely engage in left-wing experiments within China while watching China increasingly move towards orbits that were fighting communists and whatnot in other places in the world. And that seems to have, um, uh, it, it makes this period uh, of Chinese development, like very hard for Westerners, I think to completely understand. Cause on one hand, you have China beginning to side uh, in the Sino-Soviet split with some pretty objective reactionary forces abroad. And on the other hand, you have um, clear, uh, you know, radical experimentation, at least in parts of China, allowed for a little while during the Cultural Revolution. How, how do we make sense of that? And, and, and which lefts are coming, you know, and I think we have to talk about lefts plural in this time period in particular, which lefts are emerging in this time period? Yeah, it's a good point. I, I think that you know, on you know, just 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 to like to, to start, uh, I think the you know these these you know the the support of of certain like uh, you know right wing or or other regimes like capitalist regimes in a in a geopolitical confrontation against um, you know in the in the context of a geopolitical uh, a confrontation in that se in in that case between uh, China and the Soviet Union, you know, shows that how 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 difficult and how contradictory these kind of politics are in general, right? And I think we get back to that later, like when we talk about today and the support of the CCP by certain left wing forces um, again in a geopolitical confrontation uh, in this case with the U.S. and and um, but I think we cannot understand that if we don't look at what these left-wing forces in the party, um, what the role they had actually at the time within China, um, and um, you know what you're referring to is is basically the the ultra left, so-called ultra left faction mm -hmm. um, in the in the leadership uh, of the Communist Party after 1960 or starting 1968, basically um, uh, 67, 68, and I think that it's important to point out that first of all they were never in control of the leadership right like so mm -hmm. so um there was always like a until 76 when they were basically purged right this end ends in 76 when the so-called gang of four was purged and and a lot of other uh, ultra left forces within the party and outside the party as well um so we're speaking about like roughly eight years um there was an ongoing uh factional struggle between you know the so-called left and the so-called conservative faction um, on the on the course uh, of of the of the CCP uh, you know, on on economic policies on on of, of course also foreign policies um, and it, it depended you know on the time like sometimes this faction was stronger and then sometimes this and also also in economics usually the conservative faction was stronger. In sort of like you know theoretical debates, propaganda, this kind of stuff, the left wing faction was stronger. Mao Zedong, still the leader, um, before you know until he died in seventy six, I think he switched back and forth. Right, he didn't fully support either faction, um, and then also in the later phase, he was he you know was basically uh, sick. He wasn't seen in public much, um, so he he had to like sort of. He still played a role, but it's really unclear how how important um, um, that role was in the in the final years. Um, but you know, so for a start, like this ultra left uh, faction was not in control fully. The you know the other thing I want to point out is that you know when you talk about left wing forces, um, I think the 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 key uh, the key uh, movement or the key development was the mass movement and during the Cultural Revolution that basically, when actually this ultra left-wing faction kind of developed. Um, and I think there we have to see that basically that movement was crushed in uh, 67, 68, um, you know, by using the army, you know, and 
I mean, fully with the support of, of Mao Zedong. And in that process, they co-opted part of the leadership of that, you know, mass movement, the rebel movement that had taken place in the in the workplaces as well as on the streets, you know, with youth and, and young workers playing a main role. And so, this, you know, it's, it's not that this left-wing faction, the leadership after 68 was, you know, was fully like sort of, you know, left-wing force and fully behind movements, et cetera. It, it was it had actually betrayed its own its own movement um, that had promised the second revolution that had promised the end of you know the rule of the bureaucratic class etc. And um, they basically may, had made a deal with with uh, you know with Mao of course, but also with a conservative faction around Zhou Enlai and later Deng Xiaoping in securing um, the rule. Of the party, and and so I, you know, I'm hesitant actually to to say you know this was the, the, the government you know made all these left wing experience at the time. They were you know of course they tried things out. There was a still a strong uh, left wing faction surviving in workplaces, etc. And they played a role, but the you know the 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 main policies were designed in Beijing by. A regime where the left-wing forces basically, you know, had formed a kind of coalition with the conservative faction. So I'm kind of critical of, of, mm. of, 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 the, of this, of this, of this faction. Um, you know, basically the left-wing leaders, you know, they they allowed um, and supported the purge, pr prosecution, and punishment of millions of workers and youth. They were part of the uh, rebel movement in in the in the late '60s, and um, so yeah, so that's how I'm I'm very critical of them. Mm. What well, can we um? Maybe we can go into some of the specifics of these coalitions and leaders. Like, who do we see as, and this, um in this time period as part of the left-wing leadership faction and, and and maybe what kind of other emergent social forces do we see as acting as left-wing from from like 68 to 78? And then that time period, I, I think that, you know, basically after the Cultural Revolution, there was, you know, the, the hot phase, right, the mass phase of the Cultural Revolution that ended mm -hmm. in, in 68. So, you know, just to make sure, because some people think the Cultural Revolution is, you know, 66 to 76, you know, the, what the mm -hmm. party calls the, you know, the chaotic years. But I don't agree. I think the main, um, the, the important phase was, was 66, 67, 68, and then, and then it was basically crushed. And after the, everything that came after uh, was an attempt to actually, you know, reorganize, uh, re-strengthen the party structures that had been basically destroyed during the uh, mass phase. Um, and and you know strengthen uh, the rule of the of the party, and so there was even like a, a, a phase where the military played a main role uh, in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, so so this was you know we kind of bad, bad like dark times, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in terms of you know when we look at it from a left wing perspective, and then what we see in in um, in the early seventies, like you say, you know there was there was a there was basically. Um, you know, overlapping developments. So basically, inside China, we had we had, you know, first strikes again, like movements, smaller movements that that expressed, um, you know, discontent, um, and within the party and outside the party. Um, but but also we had this process um, of, um, you know, like like um, starting uh, relations between the U.S. government and the Chinese government, um, we, you know, where, where the confrontation between the Soviet Union and China plays a major, which started 10 years earlier, played a major role, um, especially after in 69, that there were actually clashes between military uh, forces of the Soviet Union and, and, uh, and, and China um, in, on, on, the, on the border. Um, and so then the Chinese regime basically decided to, you know, to form, you know, whatever, to approach the U.S. and, you know, sort of enter international politics, you know, like they joined, the, they, they successfully took over the, the place of Taiwan and the, and the U.N., um, but also they decided to start, like, um, 
importing uh, technology from from uh, capitalist countries, etc. So I think that you know th th this is a very contradictory time in 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 in, in many ways, um, and I don't think that actually the left force within the party, you know, the, the, what's later called the Gang of Four, I think they don't, they never were fully in, in, in charge, you know, I, I think they opposed some of these movements mm -hmm. uh, or, or some of these developments, but they were not able to stop them. And I, I think the, the pragmatic attitude of the leadership um, that it had shown earlier too, right? Like um, sort of, um, you know, they, they had a, they had economic problems. They knew, like you know, that that you know, social problems, housing, uh, wages, that were also behind the uh, the struggles in the Cultural Revolution hadn't been solved. So you know, they knew they had to change something, and they weren't. And I think in this, you could say the historic, the historic meaning of the left wing faction was that they prevented reforms. Um, as they started in 78, because actually the reforms um, that were carried out after 78, you know, by the Deng Xiaoping faction were actually designed already in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And Zhou Enlai played a role, Deng played a role, other people played a role, but they weren't implemented because the left-wing faction basically blocked them in, in, in a sense. And so only after um, Mao's death in 76 and then you know, the, the coup, basically, the the rest of the Gang of Four and the and the purge against left-wing forces all over China, then they, you know, had had the space and the ability, the conservative faction in the party to carry out the reform. So you could say that's actually the main the main role the left-wing faction in the party played, that they blocked um, an earlier start of this kind of reforms. Mm. So I guess this gets us to the 70s. I mean, we have the kind of, uh, you know, in the book you describe a kind of long fading of the Cultural Revolution that it's, you know, by the time you get to the crushing of the second Shanghai Commune, you're really kind of done. But it, it these experiments are still technically going on until 76. Um, there's a lot of brinksmanship uh, with military. I mean, um, Interestingly, a figure that is often considered um, left-wing in the West that I don't understand exactly why so many people consider left-wing is, you know, uh, Lin Biao and the rise and form of that faction of the army. Um, in, in the beginning of Three Worlds Theory, which... Uh, I'm not going to go into Third Worlds Theory. My audience knows I've ranted about it before being recuperated in the West because it it's it's actually recuperated wrongly like it, it in the sense that like um people forget that the first world wasn't like europe and the united states it was the united states and the soviet union um it's very like it's actually a very strange theory that has been kind of rewritten in historical memory um but that you know during this time period we start seeing that you know problems really emerge in, in kind of a new rebel period maybe maybe that's the wrong word for it um around say 1976 right with the april 5th movement so we talk a little bit about the april 5th movement yep um so yeah i think you know as i described in the book i think that a new a new phase basically of left-wing opposition starts there um mm -hmm. i think again it's important in, in especially in the movement 1976 that it not you know, it wasn't just left-wing forces, but also other forces were involved. Um, but but it was definitely like an, an you know an uprising um, that started with after the death of Joe and Lai, but then involved a lot of workers who demand. It started demanding uh, basically political changes, like more participation of of workers in the workplaces. So that. You know this movement. I put it. You know, put it in one line with um, the democracy war movement in seventy-eight to eighty, and then also with the movement in nineteen eighty-nine, the Tiananmen Square movement, um, and the, especially the workers' parts, like the, the sort of the workers' participation in these movements, 
and their demand for a workers' democracy. So I think this this is important because the, you know, when we look at the you know authoritarian nature of of Maoism of of, of Chinese socialism, um, um, and you know the sort of the the disappointment of workers that they weren't actually in control uh, of the workplaces um, and you know and their lives in a sense. Um, then, then these movements can be seen as sort of an answer to that, or like sort of coming out of out of, of this disappointment, um, uh, demanding that you know, demanding a socialism that gives them you know more voice and more and, and a bigger role in, in decision making on on the on the on the level of you know the, on the neighborhood of, of uh, on the level of, of, of the workplaces. Um, and, 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 and beyond. And, and so I think it's uh, April 76 with these mass demonstrations is the first, uh, uh, the first time when such demands kind of were voiced uh, by a mass movement. They, they were actually, you know, they were already described, formulated earlier, right? Like already mm -hmm. in 73, 74, we see like people writing posters and demanding this within the party and outside the party. And then after Joanne Lai's death and the, you know the critique of how the regime dealt with with his death. Then you know this movement basically used the opportunity um, to 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 demonstrate, um, and it was crushed very fast. Um, and um, but but still, the, and again, uh, and, you know, um, because other other people who, who have described these movements, this movement in '76 point out that you know there were a lot of um, People from the conservative faction, like workers from the conservative faction, involved. I completely agree. Um, I, I still think that it expressed this, this, um, you know, this demand uh, for for some kind of workers' democracy. And then that that was, you know, after it was crushed, then. Um, um, but then the, all the changes happened. This was like early '76, so uh, the changes like. Mao's death, and then the purge against the Gang of Four, and then sort of the transition and the start of the reforms. That's that that happened after that. Um, and in 1978, there was another movement that kind of picked up uh, these ideas and developed them further uh, in the democracy world movement. Yeah, the democracy world movement is interesting because it's really c developing convergently with like this fairly significant and and sometimes i don't think people realize how significant a right-wing shift dung actually took because you know um even you know fairly died in the wool maoist will often complain about how far dung took the liberalization removing state subsidies for the education of girls um uh basically dismantling even the rudimentary socialized medical care that was was available in china <laughs> um uh what else did he do uh, um you know uh, privatizing things that aren't even privatized in capitalist countries in the west it, it, i think the extent of privatization is often missed out upon and it, and i do think people miss how significant this was you all often hear this time period as the time period of like the great rising out of poverty for for many chinese people but i point out that, that like life expectancy for working class chinese people actually froze from like 1976 to like the middle 90s it was actually sort of astonishing um that this is seen as the the uh an end to poverty when it's like no if you were rural in china i think your life stagnated dramatically during this time period so um it it makes sense that the, not, the democracy wall movement developed I, I think it's also and, and i like that you emphasize this that a lot of these more democratic um workers movements are of a mixed character because the workers are of a mixed character so so like if you're going to have a more democratic movement in a workers movement you know in the in 76 it's going to be it's probably going to tend left but there's going to be conservative factions within it i just think like that's that shouldn't surprise us like are, are you be used to condemn the idea that like you you know we should have workers democracy because oh there's a few conservative workers out there like we of course there are like duh um 
uh, but what happened to the, the democracy wall movement? Because it's it's kind of a very it's also a kind of very quickly put down movement. So yeah, it, well, you know, it was much longer than than the than the nineteen seventy six movement, right? Um, uh, it you know could develop over roughly over the course of two years. Although you know the let's say one year was more exciting, and then and then later, of course, the repression started. Um, but but roughly it, it you know it lasted from 78 to 80 1980 and um, I think that what's important is that in these movements you know the different from the earlier movements I described where you know the, the discriminated um, you know temporary workers and migrant workers played a major role now it was sort of the core of the workers you know what you know in in the in, in big in big state enterprises etc who took part in this um, and, um, and, you know, democracy one movement is very, of course, very diverse, you know, and you, have, again, you have, you have a right wing, um, um, forces that demanded, uh, you know, some kind of like copy of the U S system or something like that. But you had a lot of, you know, a lot of them were workers who, who, you know, pointed to all the inequalities, you know, the, the authoritarian, rule of the party, the corruption, um, you know, the inequality also meant, you know, that they could see that, you know, the the leaders, the party leaders had a much better life, etc. There were a lot of issues that that these people had. Um, and they, what was interesting is that they started um, underground presses, right? Like they, they printed posters and made journals um, and it spread all over China. It was mostly, you know, it was more like stronger in urban centers um but it had a you know it was it was it was huge in, in, in as a as a you know like open opposition movement within a authoritarian regime um and it it did of course also somehow push the Deng faction right like the you know at that point Deng Xiaoping hadn't finally taken over control over the party basically uh Hua Guofeng, like another faction was basically still in power and only after um, you know that them using sort of the you know the, the impetus of the movements from below the pressure from below um, um, the Deng faction could could like so start with the with the reforms. Um, so they they basically used or co-opted in some way the content, the demands of of this of this movement again. But then they repressed it. Um, you know in in um, in 1979, 80, uh, again arresting uh, uh, many of them, uh, purging them, punishing them, um, and um, I think that what what you said earlier, like you know about the early reforms, I you know at the time, I think neither the people involved in that movement nor anyone else outside, like sort of left wing observers in other countries, uh, could immediately understand the extent. And the depth of of these reforms, um, I think it took some time, and I think also it's you know it's misleading to think that um, they actually wanted to introduce a capitalist system and get mm-hmm. get away from this planned economy. I think they wanted to repair it, you know, they wanted to strengthen it, they wanted to use like sort of you know more market, they wanted to you know allow more like sort of a private private enterprises um they want to you know they they basically they've kept you know the, uh, like rural land you know was still stayed on but they basically uh divided plots and gave it to families uh um dissolved the communes and and thought that through that the you know this sort of family farming would be more productive which is was actually in the beginning uh but i don't think they ever at that point, you know, I don't think they, the, the party leadership actually planned out like that they will, you know, whatever trans- transition to to capital. And I think that decision was made in after the movement in '89, like in the yeah. early '90s or mid '90s. But but you know, for sure, the the, the effects in the uh, late '70s were were dramatic. Um, you know, one last thing on this because I I, re, I really like this point that, that you point out this point with the you know the poverty 
and how the poverty <laughs> was maybe um, um, abolished. You know, I think you know we have to always see that it's not the regime that abolishes poverty. It's like people working hard, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and and it's like on the backs of people that that economic development was organized and. Um, and that that it was like that in in the late seventies eighties, and it was again like that in the nineties two thousands, with with uh, you know the sort of the you know world market factories moving to China and and the the whole rise. You know, it's it's not that the regime can claim, hey, we abolished poverty. You know, that people had to work hard, and many people like you know were injured, died, were overworked, you know, and suffered. Where, where you know got low pay, and I think this is important to point out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I would agree with you that Dung was not trying to like uh, restore capitalism. If anything, he seems to have been just sort of a Bukharanist during this time period. But it, it, I do think we have to look at how deep these liberalization reforms went. Um, I, I also think it's interesting that you point out that Dung actually was legitimately more popular with some of the more uh, on the street factions against the centrist faction or the whatever faction, what, you know, the the kind of uh, hand-picked successor group by Mao, neither the rightist nor the leftist, but they kind of didn't believe in anything. Um, but it's actually, you know, your book points out how quickly the Dung faction like does major constitutional changes, such as, you know, uh, as, as when everyone talks about like, oh, you know, the political liberalization brought by Dung. And I'm like, yeah, so you, the guy who abolished formal freedom of speech in China, like... Um, you know, uh, you know, the, the four big freedoms, he got rid of them. Sp that's speaking out against the government, having public debates, writing, uh, character po posters and having meetings like, um, you know, he also bans what, like, um, all unofficial state journals from being sold really tightens up controls of the press. I mean, um, and that, your book implies that this is partly because they're, they're fearing what's happening in Poland when Solidarność uh, was developing in the in the early '80s. You know they don't want to deal with that in um, in the CPC. But also, you know, it, it does seem like a lot of people on the ground felt bait and switched by Dung pretty quickly, right? Am, am I am I misinterpreting this? Um, I, I think you know on one hand. People want to change, right? Like, mm -hmm. like people were, were desperate for change in many ways, and and then of course they weren't desperate for the change that actually happened then. But <laughs> but they they wanted change, and and so and Dung basically promised change, uh, and there was no other force, you know, visible that that would have brought that um, force because the other factions in the party leadership basically, you know, wanted to continue kind of the course. Um, of, of 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 the earlier periods, and and I think that that for that reason, you know, people actually had hoped for you know in, in economic improvements, but also in the long term for you know some kind of political liberalization or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, you know, I think I don't think that was very concrete at the time, but definitely there was hope. On the other hand, you know, why why did um, the Deng faction, you know, abolished these these rights and also the right to strike. By the way, uh, in the <laughs> of course, I, I think I think it's, and this is actually connected to to later periods. I think you know the main reason is the trauma of you know sort of the party elite after the Cultural Revolution. So you know they 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 were at the brink, you know, of of losing power, losing control. Let's say first of all. And possibly losing power um, in in 67, 66, 67. So, you know, the party was dissolved. You know, a lot of leaders had to step down. Um, you know, there were there were mass demonstrations. You know, like millions and millions of people involved. Huge radical organizations um, demanding basically the second revolution. You know, taking down the party bureaucracy, etc. So, and uh, you know, Dan um, and other people. Um, in, you know, this is just like whatever, 10, 15 years later, they all experienced that. And, you know, they were themselves purged, they were themselves threatened. Um, and, um, and all leaderships after that, actually, um, 
had the same trauma. And so I think this this fear of like mass insurrection from below, you know, is very present and it was at the time and, and still is um, in some way. So that I think explains why the party, you know, basically, um, you know, turned to like author, more authoritarian measures um, mm -hmm. again and, and, and has continued to do so in some way. I mean, of course, there were mass movements after that and sort of openings, periods of, you know, where there was more space. But still, I think, you know, um, I think only after Xi Jinping, like sort of the next generation, Xi Jinping is still, you know, he was also in the countryside, etc. So, you know, it's like being a boy, like a son of an elite leader, uh, then, you know, um, uh, and being sent to the countryside. So I think he still has that trauma. And maybe the next generation of leaders, whenever that will be, will not have. But but uh, so I think that plays a major role in the late 70s and 80s. Um, and it's all, I think it's also behind the opening in general. I think that the fact that, you know, the Deng faction thought that they had to open up the, you know, socialist economy, um, that they had to reform it, also had to do with the fact that, that they wanted to secure their the party rule. And then for that, they had to improve the economic situation. And this was uh, the course they, they chose. Well, I guess that brings us to Tiananmen Square, which I increasingly see even in the Western left as, as portrayed as largely a reactionary movement. Uh, I've had guests on my show who have said that, it, you know, they thought it was mostly inspired by foreign activists, um, which, of course, they would. Right. Um, uh, uh, but I want to talk about Tiananmen Square because I do think. Like a lot of these democracy movements, it was a mixed movement. There, there was both very left wing and pretty right wing elements of it. Um, but um, it, it, it was serious, you know. Um, I mean, personally, I'm of the age where my first memory of anything that I recognized from China was actually from Tiananmen Square. Like it's, it, you know, I remember this happening. So, um. Can you give me the context, you know, uh, how the, the people who participated in Tiananmen Square saw what they were doing and what kind of factions were involved? And, you know, and what I think we kind of know the the end of the government response. I think everybody kind of knows that. But what was the beginnings of the government response? Yeah, I th you know, I think that what's important is that basically the, the people who started it um, were students and at students at that time were a very small group and mostly um you know they came from the from the leading mm -hmm. you know like from the elite right so they, they were basically uh, literally the the children of the party leaders um you could say or and you know and military leaders and economic leaders at the time uh, all linked to the party of course um and i, I think that that's important right is that that the, the you know also to understand sort of this mixed composition of, of the movement that it started off um, uh, it, in the beginning it was a, a basically a movement of these students and they had a, had a, another like an earlier movement in the mid 80s so it wasn't like the first sort of outbreak sudden outbreak but um, and I think the, the, the um, you know the why were they so angry and why did they oppose um, the regime or challenge the regime and I think this is linked to Basically, the fact that the regime, or the you know the sort of the upper class, the ruling class, had changed throughout the 80s and became more and more corrupt, and um, and so the you know sort of the feeling of injustice, the feeling of of you know being being governed by by a, a group of thieves, what you know was very was very present. Um, there was also fear of, of, of economic crisis, you know, inflation had increased due to the, you know, the reform. So even the sort of urban, urban um, middle class or, or, or ruling class, they, you know, there was a lot of dis dissatisfaction. Um, and then, you know, and then of course, on the other hand, we see this as part of a larger development worldwide, right? Like you, we had um, the change in the Soviet Union um, that, that, you know, everything was in, in flow at, the, at that time, um, um, question, uh, like the sort of 
the actually existing socialisms all over were questioned and um, and of course um, a lot of them uh, collapsed uh, soon afterwards. So I think that's the context and the students actually had, you know, in general, they had more, um, first of all, they, they wanted to talk to the regime, right? Like basically, the, you know, they wanted to negotiate um, a transition um, to, uh, you know, what they called a more dem democratic um, system. And definitely, they referred directly to uh, to Western concepts or US concepts um, in, in their movement. Still, the, you know, it was impressive how many people, uh, you know, were involved. It was, again, you know, centered in, in urban areas. Um, in many cities, not just Beijing, um, again, you know, millions of people involved. Um, but I think that's only the beginning. And, that, and th that's also, you know, when, when people now refer to it as being right wing or whatever, you know, they both basically, when they refer to that part, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't call them outright right wing, but definitely they were more like sort of pro capitalist in some sense or pro Western democracy. Um, but then, you know, there, there was a, a change. And I think that had to do with, with the support of, well, first of all, like, there was a crackdown, a kind of limited crackdown on the students uh, and the student movement kind of lost impetus. But at that point, um, and this shows the discontent of many people in China, you know, also of urban, the urban working class, a lot of people got involved. A lot of workers got involved, other, other you know, the group, urban groups in the second phase um, of, of the movement. And basically in that phase, they took the lead, you know, so workers would organize, um, in, in Beijing, they would organize on Tiananmen Square, they, they you know, have meetings there, discussions, people from different workplaces would come there, they would form unions um, and like, you know, autonomous unions. So you have this second phase where, you know, again, similar to the democracy world movement, and, and, and their discussions, then they demanded, you know, control of workers over workplaces. So it was more for like a workers democracy. And then as, as I think that's actually also explains the crackdown. Um, without their involvement, maybe we wouldn't have seen such a massive military attack at all. But when the workers get involved also on a larger scale, the regime, didn't face, you know, basically their children, their students um, that, you know, were behaving, behaving really like badly and, and, and challenging, uh, but, but uh, you know, were, were still like sort of um, uh, willing to negotiate. Suddenly they, they fa faced like this uh, big demonstrations of, of workers and, and, and other urban uh, supporters. And that's, I think, when they, the, the regime decided to use the army. When they used the army, you know, of course, they were massive. That's often forgotten, right? Like, it wasn't like it, there's just like the army coming and killing lots of people. It was, you know, people resisted. Um, and it, it also happened in, like, in, in, in different ways. So the first attempt of using the army and occupying basically Beijing was basically, uh, was, was uh, prevented by, you know, like a million Beijing people <laughs> Going onto the street and and standing in front of tanks and 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 military troops and telling them to to turn back and they did and only the the second attempt then um, on June four uh, they, they broke through because then the army had decided to shoot um, and I think this is important you know that that when, you know when people talk about Tiananmen it's often forgotten that a large part of this second phase of the movement was was supported by workers and also the resistance against the army was in large part supported of workers supported by workers so this leads us to the 90s and and what confusingly and i say confusingly because new left means like 85 different things gets labeled the the new left in china um which is often confused with the new left inspired by china and France and the United States um, in the seventies, but how do we define the new left? What do we see it emerging out of the post Deng period? You know, under Ximen and then Hu Jintao, and you know, uh, it, it seems hard 
the, what the new left is in China, if it's ever get talked about, sometimes it's presented as now as almost entirely also uh, actually secretly right wing. Uh, other times it's seen as Western identitarian influenced. Other times it's it's uh, portrayed as you know um, neo Maoist. Uh, your book kind of indicates that to some degree all these things are true. So uh, how do we break down the development of the new left in, in China from the 1990s forward? Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, you know the new left. First of all, the, those involved never not really use that term themselves. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a description from the outside. And then they were never like a unified group, you know, so that's why you have like all these different, you know, people with different different perspectives uh, involved there. But I think that why why we talk about it in the US, so-called new left in, in China, I think that's basically 90s, right? So in the 90s, you had, a, you had two, basically two developments. On one hand, you had the capitalist restructuring of the enterprises in China, and then the massive movement of of workers, um, you know, sort of the old socialist working class, so to speak, against um, this this restructuring, um, and and then was picked up by you know by left leaning intellectuals, um, and the other um, and the other part is that you had the critique of neoliberalism. Um, which is not, you know, not just in China, but all, you know, also uh, elsewhere. So it, within China, also people uh, picked that up, and um, like intellectuals picked that up, that critique, and, and formulated a, a critique of, of of neoliberalist policies within China and outside China. And at the same time, also they took up like sort of the nostalgia for egalitarian ideas or, you know, kind of what I call mystifications of the socialist period, right? So there was a revival of Mao and references to Mao in the 90s as well. So the, basically the new left kind of combined these different different parts, you know, like, sort of, you know, sort of re references to Mao's egalitarianism, critique of neoliberalism, and then a critique of the capitalist um, restructuring and the and the support of of the movements of of the old socialist working class. So all this kind of like is 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 part of the discourse um, and pushed uh, pushed you know the formation of whatever intellectual circles or debates. Even I wouldn't even say it's a it's a circle. I think it was like you know, we talk about debates, right? And people mm -hmm. sort of referring to each other and supporting each other or criticizing each other. And also the new left is kind of. It, you know, it has to also be always be understood as a sort of, the, the, you know, one part of the coin and the other part of the coin is a liberal. So at the same time as having a sort of new left debate, you had a sort of liberal, liberal in the sense of, of you know, more like sort of pro, um, pro Western democracy or pro capitalist in a sense um, group. Um, and interesting enough, <laughs> um, uh, you know, basically the proponents of both groups, uh, they came out, came out of debates in the 80s and also throughout like 1989 and the movements there, um, you know, the same groups often and they knew each other personally. Um, and and even some of the new left people had been more liberal uh, in, the, in the 80s and then changed positions. So it's basically also kind of a, you know, a certain intellectual sort of generation, you could say, that that formed both the new left and the and new liberals, uh, the, the, sorry, the liberals. And mm -hmm. now the change, that, you know, you ask about, like I think that's very important. Like, for me, that that new the discussion of new left makes sense for the '90s and early 2000s. You know, then you had the, this discussion on these these positions. Everything else that came later, I think, is is is, is even more blurred and 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 unconcrete and and um, in, you know, part like part of the people, you know, that are counted as new left moved closer to the party. Some supported a faction, a party faction behind uh, a CCP leader called Bo Xi Lai mm -hmm. in the late nineties, uh, late two thousands, early two thousand tens. And then he was perched, um, you know, because he was a competitor of Xi Jinping for party leadership, basically. And then also some of the new left started supporting sort of, you know, 
the CCP, even Xi Jinping, uh, they took on like more like nationalist Chinese positions. Um, you know, so I think that it kind of decomposed in a sense uh, in, 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 a, in a way like because, because I don't see like a, you know, sort of a, what you couldn't call, I still call like a left, new left discourse and now like coming from that intellectual scene. Well, yeah, one of the things I've noticed, um, uh, I was in uh, uh, the Republic of Korea during the Bo Xi Lai, uh, Xi Jinping standoff where, you know, they got they got him for what was probably real corruption, but the kind of real corruption you would probably find on any major Chinese official, to be frank. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then what was interesting about Xi is you have both this distancing from this kind of neo Maoist faction, but also uh, I did see an immediate recuperation. And you started seeing even in like what things clearly geared by like Chinese students towards the West, like I don't know the the Cal Collective or whatever, some stuff like that. Yeah, talking this kind of neo Maoist language, but clearly being. Um, Uh, center even kind of right-wing nationalist you started i started hearing them appropriating even in maoist form like mixing mao language with the whole thousand years of confucianism necessary for communism rhetoric uh which uh, while some some western some westerners seem to 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 somehow believe i'm like i i how do you know anything about chinese history and and think that that makes any kind of sense um just uh, the confucians were usually the people that the chinese were fighting the hardest the chinese leftist and communist and, and even the prc were fighting the hardest um so it's it's a very interesting you know sort of recuperation but i also got the feeling that other elements of this kind of quote like neo maoist movement became something else too some got more involved with the workers um it also seems like there were some reforms to policies in the countryside that kind of dampened down on some of the civil unrest in the rural areas, but that also seems to have kind of stalled. I mean, this is, and this is me like noticing trends that I would get in news in Asia about like where there was tensions and where they would come up and then how they've come up now, sometimes around the banking sector, sometimes around, you know, opposition to, uh, to this, to uh, contemporary policies. Um, so I guess this leads me to two questions and we can kind of get to where, where things are today with, with the left in China. Um, there's been a lot of discourse, even in the quote Western left, by 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 kind of neo Maoist asterisk, as a person who remembers uh, what Maoism meant in the West in the 80s and 90s, where they hated the currently existing uh, People's Republic. Um, some of those same groups now being like Jiist and Dungist confuse the shit out of me, <laughs> but whatever. Um, that we're not talking about the West. They're just something to note. Um, there has been a lot of discussion of white leftist or West, uh, you know, and Western leftists, and a lot of this discourse has also been um, re from China has been reincorporated in in English into anti-revisionist and anti-imperialist language about Western left and white left sometimes weirdly cleaned up through either Australian or Italian theoreticians. <laughs> Don't know why that is, but nonetheless, it is the case. Um, what are we to make of this call? I mean, like, uh, you know, I've, I've heard you say before that, that to speak of a Western left in this way actually tends to favor maybe even uh, right-wing factions in, 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 uh, the Chinese Communist Party today, uh, and it's a way to kind of artificially unify um, the ideology both within China and within the Communist Party against some kind of nebulous liberal Western namby pamby, yeah, you know, 
left that probably isn't all that will. Um, and also, can we even speak of neo Maoism anymore? Is that like since it seems to have kind of split in many directions? I think you've already indicated this, but to go into that a little bit, um, is that even a meaningful phrase for contemporary social movements in China? Well, in in terms of like what's the main sort of ideological or political um, influence, I would say yes, of course, Maoism is still, you know, very present in um, in debates among young young activists or or, or young intellectuals who who um, you know critically analyze the the, the state of of Chinese capitalism. Um, I, I think it you know. It, they're very different, you know, diverse, it's very diverse, you know, so it's very hard to actually discuss it. Also, I have, you know, I've talked to so people who would self-identify neo Maoist, but but we wouldn't have many disagreements on situation in China or or the way to support the workers. Um, why, you know, also, you know, they're neo Maoist, so clearly supporting the CCP and, 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 and support nationalist um, nationalist position. So I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult. I think that, the, um, you know, it's, it's important to note that we still have these groups in China um, in circles, you know, some of them referring to neo Maoism, some not, um, who um, have been partly involved in, in workers' struggles and in feminist uh, struggles and discourses. Um, they they all experience a, a, a crackdown and, and, and basically it culminated in 2018. So since then they basically had to kind of act under the surface, be more careful uh, of how they publicly um, express themselves. But they they still continue to exist and uh, and and they're still active. Um, it's hard for us to actually you know like for me or others to you know we, we cannot point them out we cannot like you know we, we can we cannot refer to them openly because it's so sensitive the whole issue of discussing what we discuss here um but definitely they exist i want to i want to go like comment on this western leftism white left accusation a little bit because i think that you know we have to be careful a little bit because i think there is a good reason um to to question um, left-wing positions on the base of their origin and positioning um, in general, right? This is not, not just mm -hmm. about China. Um, I, you know, we could talk about Ukraine or Taiwan or other places as well. I think that, you know, that it's important, like, if, if I formulate a critique or you are someone else, you know, where are we from? What's our perspective? Are we involved in, in you know, in the discussions on the ground in that in that area or not, or how are we involved? Um, and it's justified to criticize um, the left-wing positions uh, on China or the CCP from outside, um, especially if they're not based on like proper research or engagement mm -hmm. uh, or involvement, you know, in, in, in social and left-wing uh, movements in China. And, I, you know, I've seen critique uh, of, of certain positions on China or in China where I thought, hey, come on, shut up, you know, like, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, and, and um, because you because you haven't looked at it deep, deep enough or you haven't been there, you haven't discussed that with people. So, you know, as a start, I think that's, that's justified. Um, about Western leftism, of course, I'm, you know, this is the, the, the term left in Western, uh, you know, that's used often in, in China um, is, is very annoying in a way for me because it, you know it, it, it gives the impression that you know there's there's China whatever and the left in China and then there's a, the left in, in the West but what is the left the West and what about you know what about left wing positions in circles in around the world in the global South you know this is often completely ignored in the debate we're not discussing just like in China and outside China, we talk, we have to talk, um, you know, more in general about different positions worldwide, and then that gets very diverse and very complex, obviously. But it's necessary to not ignore like sort of like, uh, like left wing debates on China and you know and on other topics that are not from the West. And then you're right, of course, in China, you know, this accusation of of what you know whatever people accusing. Western um, um, leftism or you know, white 
left. Of course, that's that's you know very similar to the campaign the CCP uses in general, right, against so-called hostile foreign forces uh, and everyone who colludes or allegedly colludes with such hostile foreign forces. So I think we have to be careful how this critique is actually used from within China. And uh, it's often used just to, to defend the CCP, you know, to, def to defend, um, you know, certain uh, the, the capitalist relations there to um, to attack uh, um, any opposition, also left-wing opposition within China, and discredit it. So it's it's used in that way, um, and you know, and that's that's my second point on that. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think um, that's a fair point. Um, uh, I often find myself uh, furious with both <laughs> with both criticisms and defenses of China because they just seem to come out of nowhere i mean uh like they either take statements by the chinese government completely at face value with no critical apparatus whatsoever or they just also assume that you know uh statements by western governments who are clearly have agendas uh are are just straightforward true and you know um uh for a situation that I don't want to go deeply into, but like the situation with the Uyghurs, for example, uh, um, that's a situation where I, I know enough about that to know that both what I'm hearing from the Western press and what I'm hearing from China apologists, uh, they're like mirror images of each other that don't have a whole lot of grounding in any particular reality. I mean, um, uh, the actual like numbers out of China uh, do indicate that there's reasons to be concerned, but none of them indicate anything like a quote genocide unquote, unless you use the most broad definition given by the UN in which, you know, language policies can be genocidal, et cetera. Um, so it, it does kind of put you in lurch, right? Because on one hand, I mean, I often feel like when I'm talking to a more liberalish critics of China in the United States that I feel like a China defensist. And then when I talk to like anti-revisionist are, are people who are, um, who project things upon the Chinese regime in a more leftward fashion that I, that, you know, I sound like a utter critic of everything from China and maybe even a Sinophobe. Um, and it, it, it's very disorienting because I feel like I'm going you know, from one to the other, um, very quickly. Um, uh, but it, it comes from trying to root this in things that I know and seen, read, etc. And with the caveat that I also don't read Mandarin. So, you know, my, my knowledge base is, uh, uh interpreted through other people. Um, <laughs> even though I have been to China uh, a couple times, um, but it, it does make it very difficult right now, particularly as, um, decoupling both is and is not happening, <laughs> um, between, um, uh, the, the PRC broadly and the United States broadly, and also, um, the Belt and Road Initiative seems to have stalled. Now, uh, what, what that's led to me is I haven't heard that much about um, what's actually going on politically in China post COVID. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that's actually a very interesting place to be that the, even though that, you know, there's all these mentions uh, mentioning of things in China and the Western press that uh, uh, we're not hearing about, you know, like the large, I mean, one thing we haven't talked a lot about, but in, in like the early 20 teens, there were huge, you know, strikes and uprisings that were not, that were informal, the wildcat strikes, things like that. Uh, you know, there were, there were actions and propaganda by the deed uh, at Foxconn. People know about that, but the, um, this was actually, you know, part of the, seeming recuperation of the Boshi life action uh, um, into parts of the, of the G faction seem to be related to knowing you had to do something about this. Uh, we've heard a little bit about some unrest uh, around housing um, in China today, but that seems also largely tied to criticisms of, of um, Chinese banking policies and some, and some legitimate instability there. 
Um, but we're not hearing a whole lot about, you know, what's going on uh, from the left within China anymore. I don't think I, I'm not seeing it. Uh, so um, what what is happening in China right now in regards to uh, any kind of left? It seems very hard to articulate. It seems like it exists, but what it is does not seem clear to me at all. Yeah, let's, let's start. Let's start with you know with the changes maybe because I think that you know mm -hmm. when you when you look back to the early 2010s and the strikes and then you know the neo Maoist groupings supporting the strikes or you know there were a lot of like groups NGOs labor NGOs supporting them so this was a phase where you know the basically the rise the the, the um, you know the the growth rate was was still up. The the wages had improved, um, especially after two thousand the crisis two thousand seven eight. You know there was another push, um, and so economically and socially, you know there were there, it was kind of like going forward. You know and the, and kind of left was using this impetus and the situation and and that completely changed. You know in the last in the last ten years. So you know the uh, not just because of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, the crisis related to that, but also after, you know, that like Chinese economy has has basically stagnated in a certain sense, right? Like it's not it's completely not hasn't completely stagnated, but but compared to the growth rates uh, before, um, definitely it, it has the growth has slowed down, and also the improvements for workers, right? So the wages have stagnated. The it's very hard now to get a good job. Like all these people went to colleges, you know, you have this massification of, of education, right? So a lot of people went through through secondary education, you know, colleges, universities, finished that, you know, and and always the with, with all with the with the dream to step up socially, get a good job. And this is blocked, right? So mm -hmm. you have you have crisis on different fronts. Um, um, at the moment you, you you even have like sort of a more general slowdown that has to do with the crisis of of the of the real estate the sector, but also with in in, in other sectors. So um, so basically, you would say you know what's happening now is on one hand you have a lot of angry young people, um, and of course they are not left wing or whatever. Um, they're just angry and dissatisfied, um, and depending on their social status, you know some drop out and because they have other resources, family support, whatever. Um, and try to you know not not you know get out of the red race. So you have this whole discussion on Tang Ping and like lying flat and people trying to get out of this sort of normal capitalist career life. Um, but that's mostly middle class people who can afford that, right? Like people from working class or migrant working class background, they cannot usually cannot afford that. So those young people, even though they have a college degree or or higher, they go in into proletarian jobs basically and just to survive which also means they are dissatisfied and angry um and you know and part of that also you know feeds into sort of you know left-wing discourses on the ground but you know it's very hard as i said earlier like if you are involved in like left-wing groups at the moment like you cannot openly show your face or 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 like you know, you could do that 15 years ago, like, um, you know, like, you know, support a strike openly and, and place demands and and support demands, etc. like that, or feminist uh, uh, groups could, could, could act as such. You know, today it's mostly limited to what you can do on social media, which is more individualized. Um, and, you, you know, there you see the expression of this anger, of course. Um, but not not in an organized way because that's kind of dangerous. You know, you you might get arrested, you might get fired from a job, you might get other other pressures, and and uh, so that makes it so hard from outside to see. But definitely, there is an expression of this anger. Um, you also have you know the the, the women's um, movement um, still strong, like. Um, um, you know, there are all these policies to kind of motivate women to have more kids, uh, and they're kind of resisting that. Um, there's a discussion on, on sexualized violence, uh, 
and the reaction to to instances of that um, in, in on the internet. So there, there are many, you know, sort of um, not many, but there are certain, let's say, um, areas where where you see like this pressure from below, this kind of critique of the regime, the critique of the of the conditions which express left wing content, right, like feminist content or pro worker. Um, uh, anti exploitation content, but you, but it, you know it's hard to to um, you know we we don't really see sort of sort of platforms or or groups uh, that that represent those uh, that, that anger and that critique um, openly. So it seems like you know things have gone more uh, underground. I mean. <laughs> Actually, in some ways, one of the interesting things about the discourse in China is how much it does mirror the discourse in the West, even though it comes from a completely different context. And I think that's an interesting thing to look at. You know, people dropping out, but that's largely a middle class phenomenon because you'd at least have to have wealth, if not actual income, to do that. Um, there are generational distinctions around the amount of property value uh, gained from the, from the, from the, um, property liberalization of the 1990s, which benefited, you know, it did benefit workers, but a specific generation of them. Um, and, uh, um, and, and all that. Plus you have a, a very aging population and, and, you know, this is not of no import, but China's, you know, uh, growth rate is essentially the same as the West right now. Um, which, you know, uh, for, for yes, for the West, that would be doing good. But for the, the last 40 years in China, that's actually really, really low. Um, uh, I remember back when Western pundits were always saying, when China's growth rate dropped below 10% a year, there's the, 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 uh, the, the, the CPC is going to be uh, overthrown. And I, I, I remember finding that funny even then. But you know, clearly that's not happening. But we do see real stagnation. Um, and there doesn't seem to be an easy way out this time. Um, you know, uh, there's not a whole lot of easy production left for China to just scoop up and do. Uh, friend shoring and, and multipolarity, as it's often thrown around in, in certain internet circles, uh, uh, has actually not been as friendly to China as people would have thought it might be. Um, uh, you know, um, and that, to me, it has left a lot of the, the 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 Western, for lack of a better term, European and American left, uh, Canadian left as well, kind of unable to know what to do with the situation in China. I mean, I just feel like you know, a, a, even even as little as a year, two years ago, everybody was like, "Daddy G, come save us!" And you know, China is going to lead the way into the future. And you see less and less and less of that explicitly today. Um, at least in circles that I move in. Um, and I think that has to do with the economic cooldown and and uh, with the general sense of malaise. I, I do want to ask you um, one question, though. Uh, in the last two years, there's been a lot of talk of the Red New Deal and the, the, like some kinds of quasi vaguely social democratic-ish reforms picked up by the Chinese government. Um, uh, uh, you know, some more state intervention for the low for for the poorest and like healthcare, not a lot, but definitely some. Um, uh, some regulations uh, uh, of the market. Um, some. Um, you know, stabilization of banking, etc. Um. How has that effect, how has this so-called Red New Deal, which again al already seems to be fading into the memory of, of the discourse very quickly, uh, but was definitely in uh, spoken about in certain China watching circles um, immediately after COVID? How has that kind of played out as it seems to have largely not been as big of a reform set as previously thought? 
Uh, well, first of all, I don't think you know that that's really new. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. also, um, like you know, of course, the party, um, you know, it needs to to save its legitimacy, especially in the times of crisis, right, or slowdown or economic problems, um, and which is which is obviously facing not just because of the pandemic, but in general in the, in the last few years. Um, and um, and of course, there you know the one part of that is that uh, you know people, young people especially, they they still um, expect economic improvements, right? So there's kind of a an understanding. Okay, you know the Communist Party uh, is in power and it's authoritarian rule. You know we don't have much control, but at least you know economically we we see progress. You know we see improvement, and that has been basically broken. That is behind that, what you said, you know, this prediction if the growth rate goes, uh, falls below 10%, you know, the CCP will uh, have problems. Behind that is this sort of the social legitimacy among um, large parts of the population. And I think, you know, there's these measures, you know, I wouldn't use, you know, in, in, in China, you know, sometimes they're, they're referred to as common prosperity, which is an old term, um, but uh, they were like very limited, you know, sort of, you know, I wouldn't even say reforms, you know, like measures um, to react to, uh, you know, to, to, to problems in the economy or, or social problems, right? And, and you know, what well, part of that was, of course, you know, acting against um, certain private capitalists, especially in the IT industry, um, but they didn't dismantle that industry, right? Or they didn't take it apart and like broke it up and change it or whatever. They just, you know, put the leaders on a leash, you know, or threatened them. Um, they, part of that, you know, mostly it's more like Keynesian kind of uh, measures to intervene in the eco economy. Um, and, you know, that has nothing to do with the left-wing agenda or anything like this, in, in my view, um, unless, unless you want to describe measures by the US government, um, <laughs> uh, like welfare measures also as, as sort of explicitly left wing, you know, I, I, I just wouldn't do that. I think one, I want to point out one thing, you know, that what has actually changed um, when you look at that and, and, you know, the last, sort of in the last 20 years, like, you know, and that is the support of the middle class for the regime. And I think that, you know, that is, is a major factor. Also, when we look at like other revolutionary processes in the past, um, you know, it, it's not just like we, you know, that sort of their left wing or like whatever working class movements, social movements, challenging challenging a regime. Uh, but but at the same time, we ha also have to look at, you know, what groups uh, support a regime, right? Like what are the, the sort of the, the you know, wh where where does the Communist Party has its its, its you know sort of its its backing force? And this used to be. Uh, the urban middle class that benefited largely from the reforms economically, in you know throughout the 90s and 2000s into the 2010s, and that is in danger now, right? So, in that sense, you know there might be some changes in the future, and you're pointing to this housing, you know the the, the protests around housing. I think you know that's that's only one symptom. I think that behind that is, is 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 possibly you know I'm not saying you know I'm not predicting where it will end, but possibly a more um, serious rupture between the party elite and and a, a part, especially of, of the younger uh, part of the of the middle class that doesn't see its own economic position improve anymore. And on the contrary, it's, 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 it's getting worse, you know, and the real estate crisis is a factor. Uh, but also, as I said earlier, you know, the sort of the fact that, that it's very hard to get better jobs um, and also that you know it's 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 hard to find people, uh, young people who want to sacrifice their life just for their career, right? So there's a general critique also of that path in in life, you know, sort of the capitalist career. Um, and that you know this sort of you know if this middle class support for the CCP is actually crumbling, or will actually crumble, that that's a major major factor. Um, and you know, I'm 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 waiting. I'm wondering what we will see there in the next future. At the same time, you know, as I said, like there are still working class struggles. Um, 
you know, if you go, um, you know, if you if you check like the the reports on, on strikes, most of them at the moment are about unpaid wages. Um, you know, so that another symptom of the crisis that workers don't get paid, but they are still re rebellion, uh, rebellious. You know, it's not that everyone just accept accepts what's going on, but you know, there are lots of 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 of, of strikes of movements still coming up. And I think you said like what shall the left wing, the left outside China refer to? I think you know there are a lot of these things going on, right? You can refer to these strikes and struggles. You can refer to the feminist debates and the feminist struggles, which are still continuing. And also, you know, like like there are Chinese feminists um, often outside China who are, who, you know, who are, have a voice who who, uh, who publish on this. Um, you can, you know, we can we can you can refer to, you know, the, the capitalist structures, the capitalist policies of the CCP regime. So I think there is enough we can actually refer to. I think you're just pointing to you were just pointing to the fact some people are not willing to do that mm -hmm. because they you know they decide to you know for whatever you know because they think you know the worst enemy is U.S. imperialism so let's for, forget about all the other enemies <laughs> something like some logic like that uh, or they actually personally benefit from from the regime because you know whatever they have a teaching position in in Beijing or whatever and and then so they are actually part of of uh, of uh, you know the groups that support the regime because it benefits their own in personal interests. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to call out names here, but I have noticed uh, certain groups in, in the United States headed by certain people who happen to have certain affiliations with Chinese universities. Um, uh, so you know, um, it's just. I don't like to be that vulgar, but you know it's definitely a thing. Um, yeah, and I, I I do think I mean one thing I will say as a person, as I was mentioning earlier, who who wants to talk about this fairly, sometimes you do feel like you're you are whiplashing between uh, obvious xenophobia that's more than just you know a criticism of the of the of the authoritarian elements of the CPC. It might be anti-communism. It might just be anti-Asian racism, etc. Um, on one hand, and then um, blatant uh, apologia are ignoring things. They're like somehow giving the Chinese Communist Party credit for strikes against it or stuff like that. Just bizarre uh, frames of logic. Um, it, on the far left, you encounter the latter more, but in, in the general public, you encounter the former a lot more. And so it's at least here in the United States, um, where anti-Chinese sentiment is rampant and bipartisan, uh, you know, which is somewhat of a new development. Um, yeah. Even in cases where it makes very little, you know, where, where for example, um, uh, parts of the elements of the U.S. right and far left uh, want to uh, take a more cleanly pro-Russia stance um, for a variety of reasons, some legitimate, some illegitimate, um, and we'll still try to maintain anti-Chinese, uh, you know, orientation. Um, so it, it it does, It I think it is particularly hard to talk about right now, not just because of what's going on in China, but also what's going on in the U.S., and Canada, and Europe. Um, so... Um, I often tell people to get their news uh, about China from like Middle Eastern sources, uh, but, but not India because it has its own agenda too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely uh, tell people to go read your new book. I will say it's kind of a, um, I mean, it's like, you know, th four generations of, of leftists from 49 to today uh, condensed into a book that's under uh, 150 pages. So you do run pretty quickly, um, but it's, it's a very useful book for getting a grasp on the broad scope of what, you know, the left in China has been and what maybe what it will be in the future. It's hard to say right now. I mean, uh, 
frankly, I kind of feel like the left everywhere is a little bit more up in the air than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, uh, but who's to say? Um, where can people find your work, Ralph? Well, first of all, there's the website, gongchao.org. Um, that you know where all all the literature is, is linked, um, and and you find like you find you know fi- you will find this this podcast, you will find <laughs> other other videos, uh, um, and you know the book is is available on on the this it was published by Pluto Press, so you can you can either get it through Pluto, Pluto Press or or just order it in a in a in a bookstore, um, if you if you can't on order it on Amazon. <laughs> But but order is somewhere else. But but if you have to, well, sometimes there's no way around. Um, and yeah, I think that you know because you pointed that I, I I try to write not you know for for people who um, you know want to get all the details and get really deep into into things and ideological discussions, for instance, um, and, and or just about the current situation. I, I try to write in a way that. Gives an overview of different oppositional left movements in in China against a uh, communist party regime that has changed um, uh, uh, um, dr- dramatically, you could say, mm-hmm. over the course of that period. Um, and still, you know, there's there's kind of a continuity of, of opposition of, of challenging from below, and um, and I think that's a reference. Because that you know you you point out that earlier, you know, where where should we start? You know, what what's what can we refer to? I think there are many references we can make, and I also try to do that in the book. You know, where the things that happened in China always were kind of connected to movements and situations outside. Um, and you know, it's, it's it's interesting you say that. You know, when you talk to young uh, Chinese uh, left wing. People today or activists today, of course, their perspectives, um, the problems they have, um, you know, the, the the problems they face, the challenges they face from the regime are very similar in many ways to to the problems we face in other other parts of the country. And also, the, the, what what the left wing activists discuss, um, um, is, this, this is very similar because you know, of course, there are differences. And the way uh, societies and capitalisms are organized in Europe, in in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in the North North America, in 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 the global South, and in, in, in different regions, and in China, but but still there, you know, they are also sort of combining uh, or, or common, you know, um, mechanisms, structures that we all face, you know. Uh, above all, of course, the organizational work, the capitalist organization of work and, and life, or the patriarchal uh, system um, and, 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 and uh, the division uh, of, of people through through racism, for instance. And, and, and we have to tackle all that no matter where we are. And this is also, I think, maybe a last point on, on what you said earlier. Um, you know, of course, it's it's important, you know, to to fight against sort of an anti-Chinese sentiments when, when you know, or the racist sentiments against Chinese or, and also to fight against sort of an anti-China position that's based on whatever capitalist or imperialist or nationalist interests um, in other, in other areas like other countries. Um, and equally, it is important to, if we talk about capitalist relations or patriarchal, uh, relations in in China to also talk about these in you know the areas where we live in or where we are from, uh, and they're equally important. Um, what what is important that we don't exclude, you know, as someone from not not from China, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or also as someone from China to not exclude um, China and and uh, look at it equally, you know, sort of. Uh, and in my view, you know, if you go down and actually look at the you know the social context right the sort of everyday experiences of workers of women of migrants of, of young people in China and and um, or also of, of LGBT groups of other groups um, in China then you find a lot of similarities um, and and common struggles um, and um, you know if you are from any of these groups and you are involved in your struggle in your own place, 
then um, there's a way to relate to the struggles of, of, of these people in, in, in China. And there's enough material. My book is one example, but there's also other material that, that, uh, that you, can, you can use um, to understand better uh, these, these common problems. Yeah, one thing I would suggest uh, with your book, which is, uh, I would definitely endorse as a, as a pretty great overview, is your um, bibliography is extensive. So if people want the, you know, to read the stuff that you have been reading, uh, you make it available to them. Um, and so uh, I would definitely use your book as a launching point, but then I, you know, definitely go learn more um, and, uh, if you want to engage in, in struggles. And, and I do think, you know, anybody who's trying to be a responsible uh, socialist or communist or anarchist or whatever, you know, someone's not on that spectrum these days. Uh, you do have to deal with China. There's no way not to. I mean, it's 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 a major world historical force right now. Um, and to exclude it or treat it as somehow uh, completely cordoned off or you know whatever is, is yeah, I agree with you. It's it's you're you're missing out on a lot if you do that. Um, Thank you so much for coming on, and I'll link your site in the show notes. Uh, and I would definitely tell people that they should, they should, uh, if they want to understand uh, what you know, what we might call counter systemic left wing movements out of China after the Communist Revolution to the current. Uh, you probably have the the broadest rundown that's pretty easy to read. So, um, thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for the for the very interesting discussion today. Thank you.